Good day, grade 12. Welcome to this next lesson in electrodynamics. In this lesson, we're going to go through, through some exam examples on electrodynamics. And then once we've done that, we're going to be talking about um, possibly if we get far enough, I'm hoping we are. Let's just see. One, two, three, four, mm, five. Okay, maybe not. We'll see how it goes. Um, we, if we don't get, if we get through all these questions, then I would like to go through the, the I start the Doppler effect, but if not, then we will start the Doppler effect tomorrow. Okay, so the first question says, an electrical device is rated at 220 volts, 1,500 watts. So this is obviously the power, which is 1,500 watts, and 220 volts is obviously the voltage, okay. It says, calculate the maximum current output for this device when it is connected to a 220 volt alternating current source. Okay, so they want the maximum current, okay? But the thing is that this is the average power and this is the average voltage. So what we would get if we work this out, if we went P, okay, wait, P average equals, this is going to be the, the root mean square alternating current, okay? I mean voltage. So this will be V root mean square multiplied by I root mean square. So by using this 1500 watts and using the 220 volts, we're going to get the root mean square current out. So that's not a problem because we know that I root mean square is equal to I max over root 2. We get given that, okay? So therefore, that's not such a bad deal. Um, so therefore, if we can work this out by dividing both sides by 220 and cancelling and then just dividing, oh, that's not the calculator. So let's go back to this and then get the calculator out. So if we divide this, we go 150 divided by 220, whoopsie, no, 220, do you agree that we get 0,68? So the root mean square current, I root mean square current is 0,68. So now to find the maximum current, we need to take our root mean square and multiply it by root 2. So we're going to get 0,68 multiplied by root 2, and that's going to give us our maximum current out. So let's multiply that out. And you need to, even though this is 0 0.68, I want you to change it to 0 0.68 so that you're clearing and you're starting again with two decimal places. 0 0.68 multiplied by root 2 equals... 0.96. The maximum current you're going to get out, the maximum, is going to be 0, 0,96 amps. Okay, which isn't huge, but that's fine. You don't need much more than that anyway. Right, for the specific device. Now, the next type of question says we've got a simple motor. So the first thing you always do when you read these questions, do these questions, is you make sure that you've read them carefully, okay? And when you read them, make sure if they tell you if this is a motor or generator. At the moment, you can't tell whether it's a motor or generator, except for maybe the plus or minus, okay? You need to read it. It says a simple electric motor. Okay, so that means we know this is a motor. It's connected to DC power supply. Okay, it says when the motor is switched on, the coil rotates. In which direction will the coil rotate? Write down only clockwise or anti-clockwise. Okay, so most importantly, you need to decide which hand you're going to use. And you should know by now that the motor is your left hand. It's Fleming's left hand motor rule. Left hand motor rule. So we know that we're going to be using our left hand. So I often say to my students, don't suddenly become shy and stop 
using your hands in class all of a sudden just because you have to do a funny sign that looks like you belong to a gang. Feel free in the exams and wherever to make your little signs that look like a funny seven or whatever with your fingers, okay? Obviously, you can't see me doing it. So now you just have to follow with me, okay? The current, we always use the conventional current in our motor and generator rules, is going from positive to negative. So I can't see the rest of this side coil, so I'm going to use this coil, and the current is coming down here, okay? So let's look at this. The field is going from north to south. So the field, which is my first finger, is going from north to south. So at this point, your, your left hand should be pointing from your left to your right, okay? The second finger, which is the middle finger, is coming towards me out of the page. So that is coming towards me. So that should be pointing towards you, which means that your thumb should be pointed up this way. Okay, so that means that this, the thumb is pointed this way, that means it's rotating around like this, and we can say it is going clockwise, clockwise. Okay, now it says, suggest one change would result in the coil turning in the opposite direction. Um, well, there are a couple of things that could happen. I'm going to suggest a couple. The first thing we could do is swap the magnets. Okay, if we made this the south and that the north, then obviously it would cause the force to be in the opposite direction. Or if we swap the direction of the current. If we swap the direction of the current, then obviously the coil would turn in the opposite direction. So there are two changes that I've given you. They only wanted one. Right, let's do an, the next part of the question. It says, an electric motor is connected to a power supply with an EMF of six volts. It lifts a load of three newtons through a height of 0.8 meters in two seconds. Hmm. I really like this question, but that's just me. Okay, see the diagram below. So you've got your six volts, you've got your EMF, you've got your, which is your six volts, you've got your height of 0.8, it's lifting a load, which is a weight of three newtons. It says, determine the reading on the ammeter of if 80% of the electrical energy in the motor is converted into lifting the load at a constant speed to a height of 0.8 meters. Okay, so now listen. First of all, we need to say that you should know that there are a whole bunch of equations for power. Power is work over time, which is equal to VI. Those are the only two that are coming into play over here. Okay, the reason that's important is because we have been given the voltage, six volts, right? We can work out the power, okay? And if we work out 80% of that, we can then work out the current, okay? Oh no, yeah, if that's only 80%. Okay, so it says, determine the reading on the ammeter if 80% of the electrical energy in the motor is converted into the load on the constant speed. So the first thing that we need to do is work out the power, okay? So power is work over time. Power is work over time. Why am I bringing that into effect? I'm bringing it th that into effect because the fact that they've told us that they have moved a mass, a weight in fact, over a distance in a certain amount of time because work is also F delta X. So therefore we can say power is F delta X over delta T. So we've got the force, it's three Newtons. We've got the height is 0.8 meters and we've got the time it took which was two seconds. So therefore we can say, well, let us now work out what the power was. Okay, so let's do that. So three times 0 0.8 divided by two equals six over five. So it's 1.2. So that's 1.2 watts. Okay, 1.2 watts. But now they said that oh, this is only 80% of the electrical energy, only 80%. 
So we need to find out what the 100% was so that we could actually find out how much current was used. So we need to times this by 100 over 80. Okay, do you understand? This is 80% of the amount of total amount of energy that's being produced is being converted into using this power. So we need to find out what 100% is. So we're going to find that out by saying that is 12 over 8, which is, what is that if you divide by 4, is 3 over 2. So which is 1 comma 6, 7 watts. So the amount of power that this thing, this motor is actually providing or being produced is 1.67 watts. Only 1.2 watts is being used to convert this into kinetic energy and to move this up, okay? The rest of it, the rest of it is being used to actually drive the motor. So now they want to know the current. So P is 1.67 times by the, is equal to the volts, which we just said is 6, times by the I. So do you agree that I is going to be 1 comma 6, 7 divided by 6? Let me write it over here. 1 comma 6, 7 divided by 6 equals the current. So now, if I get up my calculator, and I go 1 point 6, oh, I didn't say point, delete, 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 point. Six, seven, seven divided by six equals SD, which is naught point two eight. So the current is naught comma two eight amperes. Okay, there we go. That was a very nice question. I like that, especially about this eighty percent. Right, now let's go back to a more traditional motor and generator question. So let's have a look at this. You can see that you're turning this thing and you can see there's a split ring commutator. Okay, so first of all, it says identify the type of electric machine and write down the energy conversion that takes place in this electrical machine. So we're turning it. Okay, so therefore this is definitely a generator. But now we need to decide if it's a AC generator or a DC generator. Now, an AC generator has got slip rings. So the DC generator has got split ring commutators. So this is a DC generator, right? Why? Because the split rings allow for the current to change the direction within the circuit, but not without the circuit in the external circuit. So that's a direct current generator. And then what is the energy conversion? They love asking this. The energy conversion is from kinetic energy. Hey guys, you can also say mechanical energy. Mechanical energy to electrical, to electrical. Okay, so it's mechanical energy or kinetic energy to electrical. Now it says the split ring commutator is replaced by slip rings. Which one of the following voltage graphs now corresponds to the above change? So what is happening is we've changed from what did we say this was? We said it was a direct current to an alternating current. So the slip rings is the alternating current. So graph A is the alternating current. And why? Because the slip rings belong to an AC generator, okay? Whereas the split ring commutator allows the current to swap direction within the, the actual armature, but not on the outside of the circuit, okay? The light bulb shown in the circuit dissipates energy at six joules per second. Think about that. That's six joules per second. An identical light bulb is connected in parallel to it. It says calculate the root mean square current in the circuit under the new conditions. Assume the EMF is unchanged. Hmm. Okay, so think about this. We know that P is equal to VI, which is equal to v squared over r which is equal to i squared r okay 
So now let's think about this a little bit. What do they say? And they're saying that the power dissipated by the light bulb is the power dissipated by the light bulb is six joules per second. It now says an identical light bulb is connected to parallel to it. Okay, so we've got one little light bulb, six joules per second, six joules per second. So in other words, that's its power. Its power is six because joules per second is watts per time. That looks like six over six. Let me write that down. So therefore, its power is six watts. Okay, now we apply another one. Okay, so what has happened to the resistance? Do you agree the resistance has now halved? The resistance is halved. So what has happened to the power? Okay, so originally the power was six is equal to V squared over R. When you add resistors, it says, assume that EMF remains unchanged. So we aren't changing the voltage, but the resistance has what? The resistance is halved. Therefore, if the resistance is halved, what has happened to the power? The power is going to be double. So the new power, new power, the new power is going to be 12 watts. Okay, the new power is going to be 12 watts. Okay. So basically now it says, and then it says calculate the root mean square current circuit under the new conditions. Okay, so the new power is 12 watts. And then now I want to know what is the current, the I root mean square. So P is equal to V root mean square, I root mean square. Okay. But V is equal to I squared R. Okay, do you agree? P is equal to I squared R. I mean, sorry. V, P is also equal to I squared R. Okay. I just need to get space to write. Just a second. I need space to write. Okay. So, let me just write it over here. Old power was 6 watts, which is equal to V squared over R. The new power, new power, is equal to V squared over a half R, which is the same as 2 V squared over R, right? Which is equal to 2 times 6, which equals 12. I'm just showing you where I got that 12 from in case you think I left it for some reason. So now the new power is 12 watts, okay? But now under the old power, we had the power old was equal to V root mean square I root mean square, right? So 6 was equal to V root mean square I root mean square, okay? So do you agree that I root mean square in the old one was equal to 6 over V root mean square, okay? And now, now we've got a new one. But, so we know that the old I root mean square was, okay, let's do it another way. Let's do it another way. Sorry, 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 sorry. Let's do it another way. <sighs> sorry, I know what the answer is, but I can't just jump into it. I have to explain it to you guys. So therefore, you can say that, let's do it this way. So we can say V root mean square is equal to 6 over I root mean square. There we go, I root mean square. Right, that's the old one. Now, now we've got the new power. 12 watts, which is also equal to V root mean square times by I new root mean square. Okay, but this V root mean square is equal to 6 times the I root mean square. Okay, do you understand what I'm saying? Um, so therefore, we can say that 12 divided by V root mean square is equal to I root mean square, right? But V root mean square is 6 over I root mean square. So 12 
divided by 6 over i root mean square is equal to i root mean square. You with me? So when you multiply it across, it becomes 2 is equal to i root mean square squared. Therefore, i root mean square is equal to the square root of 2, which is equal to, just have a second, let me clear it, square root of square root of 2 equals, that doesn't help, 1.4. So the new current is 1.4 amps. Whew. Okay, there we go. Nice, hey. Now it says, in the graph below, the solid line represents how the EMF, the solid line, represents how the EMF, okay, I just want to make sure you can see what I'm talking about, the solid one, represents how the EMF produced by simple generated change of the time, okay? So now, oh, okay, we're not going to do it again. It says, now the dotted line shows the output of the same generator after change was made. Okay, so let's have a look at this. Do you see the amplitude has doubled? The amplitude has doubled. Okay. And do you also see that the frequency is doubled? Before, it would take 0.2 seconds to complete a circuit, whereas now it's taking 0.1 seconds. So therefore, we can see that definitely we are increasing the amount of turns we're making per time. So let's have a look at this. Is there a reaction? Yes, there is. The amount of turns in the coil is doubled is not going to affect how often this, how quickly we are going to complete a circuit. So it's not that, okay? The splittering commutator is added. If it's a generator and we add a splittering commutator, we end up with a DC voltage or current. That's not it. The strength of the magnet is doubled it will definitely increase your amplitude, but it won't affect your frequency, which is what's happened. So that can't happen. So it must be that the speed of the rotation is doubled because not only have you increased the rate at which you complete a full circuit, but also you've increased your amplitude. So the correct answer is B, the speed of the rotation is doubled. So now you guys know that the quickest way to produce more voltage if you're for example cycling on a bicycle is to <clears throat> excuse me sorry i've got a cold still is to increase your speed in fact there's a gym in america i think they're probably more now but i know of anyone in america where you actually pay a certain fee to go to the gym but if you exercise on their bikes and you generate electricity for them, enough electricity for them to um, to keep the gym going, then they subsidize you and you can get to the point where they actually don't pay to go to the gym. And what they have, it's very cool, they've got like a little system where, for example, you're on the bicycle and then they've got little lights that light up. <laughs> so the harder you pedal and the faster you pedal, so instead of, you know, we've got digital displays that go, oh, you've burned so many calories and it's all fake because it's dependent on your mass and everything else. What they've got is little lights that light up that tell you how much power you've generated. And the more power you generate, obviously, the less your fees will be until um, you get to a point where you don't have any fees at all. So that's pretty cool. I don't know what happens if you go into credit. I don't know if they pay you back. I don't know anything about that. I doubt it. Anyway, so there you go. Maybe there's like free cool drinks or something, I don't know. Anyway, so here we go. Next, the diagram below represents a simplified alternating current generator, and we can see that because it's got slip rings. It says, state the energy conversion that takes place in an AC generator. The energy conversion in a generator is obviously mechanical energy to electrical energy, or you can say kinetic energy to electrical energy. Now it says a two ohm resistor is attached to the AC generator. Calculate the maximum current that flows through the resistor if the resistor dissipates an average power of 80 watts. Oh yeah. So we know that P average is equal to V root mean square I root mean square. But we also know it equals, wait I can do this, um, I squared R, it's equal to I 
root mean squared squared R. Okay, where R is the resistance. So the power average power is 80. So we can go 80 is equal to I root mean square squared times by the resistance, which is going to be 2. So therefore 40 is equal to the I root mean square squared. So then we can find the square root of this. Let's do that using a calculator, shall we? So we can find the square root of 40 equals, that doesn't help, 6.32. Round off to two decimal places, 6.32. So I root mean square is 6.32. 3 to what? 3 to amps. But that's the root mean square. And what did they ask for? They asked for the maximum current. But we know that I root mean square is equal to I max over root two. Therefore, if we take 6 comma 3, 2, and we multiply by root 2, we get I max. Okay, so let's do that. So we're going to go 6.32, mm -mm, 0.32, really? <sighs> 3, 2, and multiplied by root 2 equals 8.94. Because remember, we look at the 7, we round it up, so it becomes 8.94. So therefore, I max is equal to 8.94 amps. There we go. Not such a bad question. It's quite a nice question. Now it says, on a totally separate note, a television, okay, so to erase all the ink, a television is switched off on, an av on for an average of 142 hours per month. The television is rated at 1,200 watts, 220 volts. ESCOM tariff is 125 per unit. Calculate the monthly cost of electricity used by the television. You know what? This is not in your curriculum anymore. This is using, um, yeah, this isn't in your curriculum anymore. How cool is that? That's very cool. Okay, Doppler effect. We've got time. We've got 15 minutes. So let's get started with the Doppler effect. Okay, so the first thing I did was I took a thing from um, Sheldon and the Big Bang Theory and I played for you, but unfortunately you can't really hear. So I'm going to put my mic really close to the screen. So just hang on. Okay, I hope you heard that. Um, and his image, if you're trying to see, is not a zebra, in case you haven't seen the show. That's actually an image of the Doppler effect lines, and I will show you what he's talking about in a minute. So that, for me, geek humor, I'm sorry, but there you go. That is Sheldon from the Big Bang Theory explaining the Doppler effect. But what is the Doppler effect? The Doppler effect is a parent change in the observed frequency of a wave when the source or the detector moves relative to the transmitting medium. Okay, so that's really big words. What we're saying is that if you are making a sound and I move relative to you, or I stand still and you move relative to me, then it could be, or I could perceive there to be a change in frequency. And that's kind of what Sheldon was showing here when he went, Eow! because what he was saying was that as a car was going past you, it might start from having what sounds like a low fre high frequency to a low frequency, depending on whether it's coming towards you or away from you. So the Doppler effect occurs when the source of waves or an observer move relative to each other. Also, we could both move, okay, but you guys don't have to worry about that too much. Resulting in the observer measuring a different frequency of the waves than that the frequency is actually being emitted. So let's look at this animation. So we've got a source. It could be anything. 
it's producing waves. Okay, so at the moment, at first it was a fire truck producing sound waves. This is a sun producing um, light waves. And here is a duck and he's producing water waves like a ripple in the pond. So it doesn't matter whether we're talking about sound waves, water waves, or light waves. The Doppler effect works the same way. And admit that sound does is a longitudinal wave and, so, and the, the rest are transverse waves, but the principle remains the same. Okay, so they're all emanating from a single source. Okay, so now what happens when the single source starts moving? Okay, so if the single source starts moving in one direction, do you see that what is happening is that as the source is moving in the same direction, in this direction, there is a compression of the wave fronts. These are the wave fronts, right? And is because the source is moving in this direction, the, these wave fronts are being compressed, whereas these wave fronts are moving further and further away. Okay, I know it's a bit hard on the eye, but have a look now. See again, going in the opposite direction. Oh, I hate when it does that. Just a second. When it's going, let's just see if I can start it. Okay, when it's going in the opposite direction, you can see, now if I'm looking at it from this side, I will see waves that are being compressed, whereas if I'm looking at it from this side, I'm seeing the waves getting further and further apart. Okay, so the Doppler effect is a parent change the frequency of a wave caused by the relative motion between the source of the wave and the observer. Now you guys are in grade 12, so I'm going to say this again. When it comes to your definitions, you need to go look at your exam guideline. Your exam guidelines have all the definitions you need to know for matric and they've got them perf perfectly worded, okay? If you do not state your definitions almost word perfect or just about word perfect, you're going to lose out on marks, okay? Because there are huge debates about whether or not you actually understand the definitions well enough to be able to um, state them in a different way. Okay, it's not my argument, I'm just telling you what they say. So you guys need to state the definitions word perfect and or word perfectly. Now, I know it's ridiculous, but it needs to be done. Secondly, it's not actually ridiculous, there's a reason. And secondly, um, what you need to know is that if you if you leave out a word, they've been nice sometimes. Sometimes they'll say, okay, fine, we'll give them some of the marks. And sometimes they will give you no marks. So let's just have a look at this definition. It says, the Doppler effect is the apparent change in the frequency of a wave caused by the relative motion between the source of the wave and the observer. And that's the whole point about this definition. If you leave out the word apparent, this changes, it just says the Doppler effect is a change in the frequency of the wave caused by relative motion, and then is no real change. It's only an apparent change because we perceive it as so. The person that is producing the source of sound, whether it be, or the thing that's producing the sound, the source itself, whether it be the fire engine or the duck or the sun, are not actually changing the frequency that they're giving the waves off at. We're perceiving that the frequency changes is because of the relative motion. So that is why saying or learning these definitions so that you know them word perfect or word perfectly you, is so important, okay? Or if you say the Doppler effect is the apparent change in the frequency of a wave caused by motion between the source of the wave and the observer. Again, all wrong, all wrong. The whole definition's wrong. So that is why they are so strict about this. So please, okay? There's my little rant. Moving on. So let's have a look at this. If we assume assume that the observer is stationary, so he has a little dude, okay, and he's stationary. As the source is approaching you, as you saw, the wave fronts get compressed and the frequency is therefore higher. What's important to realize is that with sound, a higher frequency is a higher pitch. In other words, it will be like this, okay. Um, because it's moving towards you, therefore these are going to be um, oscillating at a higher frequency and a higher frequency is a higher pitch. Whereas as the source is moving away from you, the wavefronts are further apart and the frequency is lower, 
So therefore you've got a lower pitch, a bit like a whale in Finding Nemo. Okay, right. So higher pitch, higher frequency coming towards you. Lower pitch, okay, means it's going away from you. There was a question in an IB exam a couple of years ago where they said a girl has her back to the source of to an ambulance and she hears the ambulance um, and it says explain how the girl knew that the ambulance was coming towards her and what they were really aiming for is the fact that this oh, coming towards her and then going away what they um what they were aiming for was that she would say that as it was coming towards you, she would hear a higher pitch, and as it was going away from you, it would sound a lower pitch, okay? So it'd be like, Ew! okay, high pitch, low pitch, okay? But, but the thing is that a lot of kids were quite bright, and they said, well, as it was coming towards you, the sound would be louder, and as it was moving away from you, the sound would be softer. This is true, but, Within the respect to the Doppler effect questions, you need to talk about pitch, guys. You can't go around just talking about volume, okay? Especially if it's a Doppler effect section. Right, so now there's a formula, which you get given on the formula sheet. And all you guys need to know is how to use this formula. Okay, so the formula provides a relationship between the frequency emitted by the source and the frequency measured by the listener or the observer, okay? So FL is the frequency of the listener. If S is the frequency of the source, V is the speed of the waves. So for example, speed of sound in air is about 340 meters per second. Okay, VL, VL is the speed of the listener and somehow it doesn't come in. VS is the speed of the source. I don't know how that happened, sorry about that. VS is the speed of the source. Okay, so now the thing is, that the tricky thing is you'll see there's a plus and minus here and a plus and minus here and these plus and minus make a difference and it depends on whether it's coming towards you or going away from you okay so there is a little thing that you can learn okay so there's a little box that you can learn which says that if the source is moving towards the listener then vs is negative and if the source moves away from the listener vs is positive or if the listener moves towards the source, VL is positive, and if the listener moves away from the source, VL is negative. Okay, but now what I find with this type of thing, and I'll explain how to work through it now, is that I struggle with it because just now you get into the exams and you swap these by mistake because you've learned it and you've got confused. So it's not really worth learning it. It is better, okay, you can learn it, but it's better for you to understand it. Okay, and this is the thing, if you just remember that if it's approaching you, the frequency is higher, and if it's going away from you, the frequency is lower, then it's easy to work out what these things do. Okay, so let's say it is coming towards you, the object is coming towards you, okay, then, and you are stationary, okay, so you frequency of the listener equals V over V, you are stationary, so this doesn't make a difference, right? That is zero, and this is the frequency of the source. Now, if it's coming towards you, what's going to happen? It has to be a higher frequency. If this F of L is a higher frequency, that means that this, the numerator, has to be bigger than the denominator. The numerator has to be bigger than the denominator, so therefore we have to make this positive. Okay, do you understand? No, sorry. We have to make this, uh, let me just uh, erase. Oh, I didn't mean to erase everything. Let's try again. So, F of L is equal to, now, I'm standing still. I'm not moving at all. The source is moving towards me, okay? So, it's V over plus naught, okay? It's not moving. Over V, and this is the frequency. Now, if this is coming towards me, so it's to me, to me, Okay, do you agree that this F of L has to be bigger than F of S? Because I'm hearing it coming like this. Okay, it's a higher frequency. If that's the case, the denominator has to be smaller, which means that this has to be minus Vs, because then the numerator is bigger. Okay, do you understand that? Whereas if it's away from me, we've got F of L 
is equal to V over V, and you've got Vs, F of S, right? But now, if it's a way, F of L is smaller than F of S. So this has to be a fraction. It has to be like 3 over 4, or 2 over 5, or something. This has to be a bigger number. The number at the bottom is going to be bigger, so that's a plus. Okay, so you can learn this, okay, but it's easier for you guys to just work it out. Okay, let's take an example of where the listener is moving and the state, the source is stationary. Okay, so let's do that. Um, so we've got now the listener is moving. So FL is equal to V and then VL over V, that's zero, and this is F of S. Now let's say I'm moving towards I'm moving uh, towards the sound if I'm moving towards the sound do you agree that the frequency that I hear is higher than the frequency that is actually being produced because I'm moving towards it so therefore the numerator has to be positive okay whereas if I'm moving away what's going to happen my f of l has to be smaller than f of s which means that it's going to be V minus VL over V over F of S. So that's another way to remember it. It's just that if I'm moving towards it, or if we're coming towards each other, the numerator has to be bigger than the denominator. The number at the top of the fraction has to be bigger than the number at the bottom of the fraction. If we are moving away from each other, it has to be a proper fraction. In other words, the numerator has to be smaller than the denominator. Okay, so we're going to love and leave it at that. And what we will do is tomorrow we will do examples where we put this into practice. Right, have a great day.